In last week's episode, we answered all your questions about our 2018 season, our highs, our lows, and all sorts of interesting questions that our patrons had for us. This week, we are continuing on with that theme, so if you haven't seen the first episode, click this link here, and otherwise, carry on watching. Uh, We have a question from James Bennett, who says... uh, when we are looking at catamarans, so changing subjects slightly, um, what telltales do you look for to gauge quality of the build? Um, and apart from quality, what features are must have or can't have? Uh, so he, uh, James, would like us to talk a little bit more about catamarans. And are we wanting to talk about that right now? I'm going to keep it brief. Yeah. And I think we're going to explore this later because we're making absolutely no, it's no secret that we're looking for another boat and we will be looking for another boat over the next year. And it's no secret that we're really looking towards catamarans. We put build quality above everything, but that obviously comes at a price point. And so really, if you ask me to look at one thing to judge the quality of a catamaran, of a build, not of a catamaran, but of, um, a boat, whether it's monohull or trimaran, I would look in the engine compartment. I would look at the engine compartment and see how well everything is put together. So engine compartment and steering quadrant, look at those two things because for us that's the biggest disparity I have found in the build and the organisation of any boat. So good boats tend to have really well organised engine compartments, really well kind of organised, labelled, crash bulkheads, sealed compartments for the steering quadrant and the engines. And other ones you're like really would i put that together and we put some stuff out before about that so if you want that's that's kind of like if i was looking at a flag what would i look for i'd look at the engine compartment so as um we kind of go through the process of researching what our next boat is going to be uh, whether it's going to be catamaran or monohull and we're going to be doing kind of contrast and compare uh, episodes as well um we will go into this in much greater detail yep. and we'll show you guys exactly what it is that uh, Nick in particular looks for. Um, yeah, you're going to get a lot of going. nerd stuff. Yeah. You really are. So uh, that's a great question, um, James, and we will be exploring that in great detail uh, probably over the next couple of years, maybe next year, maybe not. Um, so, yeah, sorry to keep that brief, but um, we'll, we'll be exploring that. In, in de- You'll be sick of that subject. By, I know. won't. <laughs> <laughs> by the time we finally like, settle on a new boat, you'll be like, thank God they can stop talking about it. So we have a question from Glenn Peters who uh, says, do you, have a, do you currently have a Cunningham on your main sail? And if so, how often do you use it and under what conditions? Uh, no, we don't have one. Um, I, Cunningham is essentially, it's a, it's a line that is on the, on the kind of... Uh, <laughs> Do you want to Google it? No, no, it, it's, it's on the luff. So on the luff of the main sail, you yeah. pull it down, it tensions it tensions that aspect of the sail. Okay. I, I've, ne- I've seen them on catamarans. I think that we can, we can flatten our sail quite... How is well, that different to just, like, um, using the halyard? Well, you can use halyard tension. Okay. But I think, I, I've seen Cunningham's on dinghies, and I've seen um, Cunningham's on, uh, on catamarans. I've never seen one on a, mon- on a large monohull. So, we don't have one. We could fit one. There's actually a point for putting it down. I, I wouldn't see the need for us to use it on. Uh, okay, so Glenn has another question, which is, when we're cruising as opposed to island hopping, how much attention do you pay to the setup of your cells and their management? Uh, I, I think when we... Okay, so basically, I pay a lot of attention to it. Upwind sailing in light winds is the most the, the, the most crucial time to look at your sail trim and your sail management because you're trying to really capitalise on any small kind of gusts, uh, wind shifts to get the boat to move forward. So that's really important. When you're kind of on the beam, it becomes less important. Um, and 
and then as you go downwind it becomes less important from a sail trim point of view in my from my point of view but you've then got to be more mindful of jibing so sail management for the actual trim of the boat to make to increase performance light winds upwind sailing that's kind of like well, i'm on it all the time tweak 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 what are we getting is it changing and it keeps you occupied on passage you know you're looking at things and going have we got the point one or not you know i came from a not a, a not a racing background but i used to club race when i was in when in my you know when i first started sailing so you kind of like there's no faster and better way of learning than going out with good older sailors that have been doing this for years and then going tweak that you'll get half a knot out of it tweak that you'll get point one of a knot out of it and it is kind of like upwind sailing yeah that's when you need to do it so i do yeah we um we I think that when you're just doing like a 20 mile a day or whatever then you don't pay much attention to sail trim or maybe we don't pay as much attention as we could to sail trim because you know we're going to get there that day at some point it doesn't really make any difference if we're there you know an hour later or not but we were really um, paying sail management and sail trim a lot of attention when we were crossing, crossing the Atlantic because A we had to, the conditions were so changeable, I hope you can hear me over the wind and B uh, you know when you've got 2,000 miles to cover, you want to be going as fast as you can so well, that you're not spending three weeks at sea. Well, for our boat, to do the crossing between Bermuda and the Azores, yeah. half a knot difference was two days. Bermuda to the Azores, yeah. so yeah. 20, 20, yeah, 20 yeah. days. Yeah, so you think that it doesn't make much of a difference, but over the course yeah. of a couple of weeks or a couple, a couple of thousand miles, yeah, it makes a huge difference. It makes difference. a huge difference. So we were constantly, yeah, paying attention to, to sail trim. So Bob has a question for us, which is, what places did you want to get to in the Caribbean or America that we didn't get to see? I, there's loads, but I have got a real hankering to get back to the Caribbean. I, I can't help it. I really want to get back and, and do another couple of seasons there. So uh, the answer to the question is, all the places we didn't go and see, it's not like they are past and we're not going to go back to them. I want to get back across the pond. I want to spend a lot more time in Martinique. I love that place. I want to go up to St. Lucia and do the jump ups at Gross Islet again. I want to go and spend winter in Grenada. I want to it's do actually all... summer in Grenada. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, and we, we didn't we didn't film uh, the kind of lured islands uh, because we haven't started our channel yet. Yeah, so that's the thing. That... all those things we'd never filmed. No, but um, yeah, we will get back there at some point and um, film all that. And I think that what I re not regret not going to but I wish that I hope that one day we can go to is um, Maine I really want to go and sail around Maine we'll go to Maine it's meant to be beautiful okay Maine it is um, like a line okay Devon asks um, how did you plan meals while underway uh, did you meal prep while in harbour um, or did we cook every day we don't do much preparation because uh, we don't have the storage space so um, we buy kind of raw ingredients and we make them when we're underway because if you think about it you'll cook like let's say a casserole that takes a lot more space in your fr freezer or fridge yep. than just like the meat would have done um, and we just don't have that storage space so we're pretty constricted when it comes to meal prep um, unfortunately we do tend we tend to cook uh, something for the first couple of days, you know, like the morning of our departure or maybe the night before our departure, and uh, that will kind of keep us going for the first couple of days so that we can settle in. But then after that, we're just going for it on our own. Which, um, yeah, there's definitely been times where we wish that we had something that we could just well, heat up. Well, I mean, oh look, we firstly on the, when it's not rough. There's not a lot to do on a boat, so cooking actually becomes almost the highlight of your day. Yeah, that's you end up doing a what you know, who's going to cook dinner, what we're going to have. Yeah, and you know, it, it takes it it, consume, it takes time up, which is nice. Yeah. We also do have, although we don't prep food, we always have what we call emergency meals, which are literally like put it in a pan, like and and heat it up, and that's that's what you're going to yeah, get. Yeah, we have food that we can like cook very silly things like tin ravioli, like. Yeah. Uh, do pasta, you got tortellini, you just throw in and add pesto to mm. things that will take less than five minutes to put together. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so we always we always have those emergency meals. We always, I think, one of my biggest worries um, when we were crossing the Atlantic was that we were going to run out of parmesan <laughs> because parmesan to us is a stock ingredient because it just it you know it lifts any meal. <laughs> Mm. 
So we have one more question from our patrons, which is uh, from Daniel Parker, and he asks about our lift kill. He wants to know, is our lifting kill stable in heavy seas? Um, have, you, have we ever been knocked down? And what are the positives and negatives of a lift kill? So uh, the answer is it's, it's hugely stable. Uh, and the thing about the lift kill on the southerly boats is the weight uh, and, and, and the, the writing moment doesn't just come from the actual keel itself. There's a keel plate. The keel plate is about, I don't know, eight foot by four foot, and it's a, a good inch of cast iron. So the keel sits inside the keel plate, um, and with the keel fully down, you gain, I think it's an extra five degrees of angle of vanishing stability of the keel fully up. So even with the keel fully up, the boat is hugely, hugely stable. Um, you can lock the down and you can lock it up with a massive plate pin I think you would have to be in some fairly bloody horrendous conditions and I mean absolutely outrageous conditions to, to to get inverted in that in our boat just because it is so heavy at the body so bottom heavy um, and we would never want to be in those conditions realistically speaking having the keel where you know if you do hit something if you were to hit a container or something submerged the keel just moves up um, so to me um, I would. I, I, don't, I can see very few situations where I would lock the keel down. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And in terms of um, advantages and disadvantages, I mean they're they're obvious really. Um, you know, a huge advantage of the lifting keel is that we can lift it and get into really shallow anchorages or go over kind of river bars um, at different states of tide. Um, we can get into like for example Alvor. Uh, you know, there was apparently a marked channel, but the marker buoys were in a completely different position to the actual channel itself, uh, which was in a different position again to the uh, kind of where the GPS said it would be, or the chart plotter said it would be, the charts. So, um, you know, with our lifting keel, we did go around an outlaw, even with our keel up, but, uh, you know, we were able to, to go over quite shallow patches with our lifting keel. So that's the main advantage, um, and yeah, if, for those of you who are thinking about going to places like the Bahamas or sailing kind of, um, you know, the French Atlantic coast or the USA Eastern coastline uh, where you have a lot of shallow waters, then, you know, the advantages would be obvious to you. So, I, yeah, I, I don't think I'd ever want to look at a monohull that didn't have a lift kill if I had the choice. Yeah, the, I mean, the, the disadvantage is probably cost. Um, because, and I guess a, a, a little bit of extra maintenance, um, we'll have to take the boat back to uh, the yard at some point um, to get the keel serviced. Um, oh, I talked to them about that, apparently it's not completely, it's just, it's a Fugazi. Oh, you don't have to. The service interval is 25 years, it's not 10. Oh, well, in that case forget about the maintenance. But um, the cost is huge, they're, they're very, very yeah, expensive. but worth it. But, worth it. Like, in, in my Depending on what cruising ground you're looking at going yeah, to. Yeah, if you want to just look, if you want to just cross the Pacific, but you know, being able to get into an atoll two or three hours earlier because you're waiting for tide or there's not enough water, it's it's very subjective. It was it was it important to us? Yes. Is it still important to us? Yes. Is it going to be important to someone else? No. Is it going to be important to someone who races really hard and wants like a nine foot fixed fin kill? No. Mm, this yeah. is just us. Yeah. And we made the choices. You know, you make choices with the information you have at the time and then you hope that you made the right choice. Um, four years on from setting off and seven years on from having the boat, I think we still made the right choice. Yeah, definitely. So that wraps up our Q&A. Um, thank you to our patrons for submitting those questions. And I think that, you know, we just want to conclude by saying that 2018 was a truly fantastic year. We got to do some really awesome sailing. Um, we challenged ourselves, which was really pleasant. Um, because sometimes you can get into a bit of a rut so yeah the, the challenge of crossing the Atlantic um, was very welcome and we saw so many places we visited so many different countries and islands um, that honestly we never would have been to if we didn't sail so we're very grateful for that and uh, from you know it comes kind of like slightly different point of view I think that we've both really enjoyed uh, kind of creating these videos for you guys and managing this channel. It's just continued to grow and for that I only have you guys to thank. Um, so yeah, from the bottom of our hearts, thank you so much for supporting us this year. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much for watching this week's video. If you like what we do and you want to see what we do every week, then please hit that subscribe button. So Bob uh, has a question about uh, what we 
didn't get to see the Caribbean and, and America that we wish that we could have done. So, sorry, I'll reword that. That's a really... A question from Bob. A question from Bob. Wants to know all the things we did see. <laughs> anyway, anything else you want to add? No, I'll, I'll reword that. So, I think I worded it fine. No, you word it again. Word it the way you want to word it. Go on, get on with it.